Pastor John comes home from a very difficult meeting. It was a capital funds campaign, and that always adds pressure to his life. It also adds shame because last time they did this, he didn't raise any money, and he's still embarrassed about it. He comes home and tells his wife that they're asking him to raise this ungodly amount of money, and they believe he's capable, but he just doesn't think it's possible. Mm -hmm. She makes one little comment about how he should have a better attitude about it and have faith, and he explodes on her taking out all of his frustration on her and naming some of the things recently she's done to offend him. And he vents and he feels better, but she feels completely torn apart. Right. Emotional regulation in ministry is one of the most difficult things to handle. And they don't really teach you how to do that in seminary. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Linda, you saw an Instagram post. Yeah. By Nicole Zazowski. So our friend Nicole had recently posted a quote and it said, venting keeps us more deeply entrenched in our pain while emotional regulation moves us toward empowerment and peace. And one of our Glasshouse listeners responded and said, now that is an episode I would love to hear more about. So, of course, we get on the call with Nicole and said, hey, can we talk about this? So welcome, Nicole. You're here to talk about (laughs) emotional regulation. Yes. Thanks for having me. Nicole, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself who may have missed a previous episode. Sure. Uh, I'm a marriage and family therapist here in Connecticut, just outside New York City, uh, occasionally I get to do intensives and, and speaking in other parts of the country, but I'm, I'm mostly here in my private practice. Uh, I am a mom of three young kids and a wife, and I have written two books. The first is called From Lost to Found, and the most recent one is called What If It's Wonderful? Mm-hmm. That was you, our first That was our first episode with you, was after yeah. we both, Ben and I read that, and we're just completely... Fantastic. Yeah, it was Thank great. You. I'm glad I've applied it all now. Yep. Everything's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> all fixed up and fine. Great. Yes. We're waiting for your next volume. Uh, Nicole, we just had this conversation this week about our marriage. And mm-hmm. that is when I'm having a hard week, sometimes I just need Lindley to be that person that can just let me vent. Mm-hmm. I may not even be nice to her. I need her to absorb my emotion. And so the way we say this is, okay, you just need a punching bag right now. Is that what you mm-hmm. need? And I'm that person. I can't help it, but sometimes in ministry or in business like at Lifeway, I come home and I just, I'm not a safe person. I'm upset. Mm -hmm. I'm frustrated. She sees all that. Can you just help us have a conversation today about what, what's healthy about that? Yeah, go ahead. I think the thing that I'm learning is that if he comes home and is sad, I'm not comfortable with him being sad. That's Mm -hmm. what I want to say. Like, it's not about being a punching bag to me. It's that if he comes home and says, I'm kind of sad about a decision, my tendency is to say, but look at all the good things that are happening in our life. So I do, I didn't want to be like, you say that. I'm trying to be less sarcastic and just say, it's, that's been something that's new to us is figuring out like what we're talking about, emotional regulation of when is it okay for him to be sad? And when is it a point to where we get nervous about it? Or angry. When yeah, is it okay for it me to feelings, be angry? Just feelings in general. So sorry so, for that. There it that is. was a little caveat there, Nicole. Counsel us. <laughs> so when we, we're talking about two different things here. The the first, and they're related, but the first is the pain underneath our reactivity. Because often what we see is the reactivity or the ways that we're re- coping with our pain that is totally understandable, but not very helpful. And the story that you've lived so far really informs the kind of reactivity that you tend to employ when you're in pain. And a model that I use in my therapy practice is called restoration therapy. And we would say that there's four main things, four main ways we tend to react to our pain. Blame, so blaming other people, raging, sarcasm can be in that bucket. Um, even the silent treatment, it's, it's quiet, but it's withdrawing to punish. It's a blaming posture, even though it's not loud. Um, shame, shaming yourself. So, Eeyore would be the poster child for shame. Um, shame is a way we talk to ourselves that we would never say to somebody else. Mm-hmm. So just really hateful words about your identity. Control can look a whole different host of different ways. Um, people pleasing, performance, literally micromanaging somebody else, getting really perfectionistic, invulnerable with our feelings. Uh, would all fall in that control bucket. And then escape, which also has a lot of different faces. But basically, any way that we numb, whether that's shopping, sleeping, drinking, drugging, um, anything that that takes the feelings away temporarily and presses pause. Mm. 
we don't do any of those four things without being in pain. And pain comes from two different directions. It's either pain about our identity. So for instance, in your story, Ben, that you shared just a few moments ago, perhaps that pastor was feeling inadequate or like I can't measure up to expectations. For sure. um, and so there's a powerlessness there. Uh, I would have to talk to that pastor to know uh, how <laughs> exactly how he's feeling. I can call are, him for you. What's that? I can give him a call real quick. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, a, a lot of how we feel depends on our history as well. So the three of us could go through that same meeting and all be emotionally triggered, but all experience three different things based on the stories that we've lived and the emotional wounds that we carry around. Um, and so, Lindley, in your example with, I'm really uncomfortable with Ben feeling sad. Um, I would want to know, you know, what is, what do you feel about yourself or what do you feel about the relationship when Ben is sad, because that that sounds like a painful thing for you. And and then you react by trying to fix it. Mm -hmm. Is fear a form of pain? I think we get fearful because of something in our identity or our sense of security and safety. So I would I would say anxiety while we talk about it as a feeling in our culture is actually what we would call a secondary emotion. It's a reaction to a deeper belief about who we are or our standing in the world or in a relationship. We began with that quote about the venting. Mm -hmm. Would you help describe the difference in emotional regulation and venting? Because you talked about how there are examples of how we justify things. There was four examples of how we justify our feelings. So venting is where we just, and a, a helpful question when it comes to venting versus emotional regulation is what are you looking for? Often when we're venting, we are looking to stay more entrenched in our emotional experience and have other people's permission to stay there. And so we all, it's helpful to talk through emotions with our friends or family members. We need relationship. We need other people to help us process. But is the goal, for instance, maybe to help me name how I'm feeling? So I'm overwhelmed. This really painful conversation or situation just happened to me. And I'm going to phone a friend or talk with my spouse and, and help have them help me identify why this is so painful for me. Hmm. That would be one step in emotional regulation because the first step is actually naming the pain about our identity or sense of safety. But if I'm just talking to my spouse or phoning a friend and wanting them to validate and justify me staying exactly where I am in my unhealthiness or reactivity, that isn't helping me move to a new place. That's looking for justification to stay exactly where I am. And when I'm venting, I am, because we, we have a choice when we have a feeling. So say I'm feeling inadequate. Um, if I'm venting in that place, I have a choice as to whether I am looking to speak truth to that feeling and do something different with that pain that's connecting, or if I just want to stay there in my reaction. And the, here's the tough thing. The brain prefers what it knows, not necessarily what is healthy and true. And so if your brain is used to reacting in a certain way when it feels pain, it's going to take a lot of discipline to emotionally regulate and, and move to a new place. Hmm. Can you, so you've studied this, you kind of understand this. So if you're upset about something and you call a friend or talk to your husband, how, what's the best way to start that? Because I, there's several text threads on here on my phone that you could say, Hey, I just need to vent. Mm -hmm. hear, hear me out. Yep. So what's a better way to start that conversation or helpful? I think the difference or one difference is starting the conversation, taking responsibility for our own feelings versus 
and we, we usually don't say this, but often when we're venting, we're asking the other person to take responsibility for our feelings instead. And the problem is that they are not empowered to emotionally regulate us. So I think instead of saying, I just need to vent, just starting with, I am feeling powerless or I am feeling not good enough. Normally, when I feel that way, I would react in this way. I know the truth is. And so instead of reacting this way, here's what I want to do instead. That's naming the feeling because the feeling is real. And most of the time we have very good reasons for feeling the way that we do. And almost calling your brain out on what it might be tempted to do. But you're not asking the other person to say, tell me I'm good enough or tell me, you know, speak truth into that. You're claiming that truth for yourself while you're walking that through with the other person. So what would Pastor John have come home and said after that meeting? uh, One example would be, I'm feeling like I can't measure up to expectations and I'm getting anxious. I know the truth is that all I can do, all I'm empowered to do is my best And so instead of getting anxious, I would love to talk this through with you and maybe see if we can come up with a best next step and and what I actually can do about this. Why is it harder for men to admit that they're weak? Hmm. Like for me, I it's easier for me to get angry Mm -hmm. than to sit down and say, I don't know that I have the emotional strength to go through another capital funds campaign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like that sounds wimpy. (laughs) <laughs> what do you mean you don't have the emotional strength man up like but i've felt that way before like for sure. me capital funds campaigns were very draining because i'm not like by nature someone who enjoys fundraising mm-hmm. um and so i just don't know like sometimes why i don't be more vulnerable mm-hmm. i think by and large um i mean there's a few different factors that that inform that but our culture has not done a great job of giving men permission to feel the full range of our Mm. emotions, let alone express them. And so a lot of that is a cultural construct. I think we're, we're hopefully getting a little bit better with that and realizing that no emotions are off limits to men and women that we, we both feel uh, the full range of emotions. And there's a tremendous amount of strength in being vulnerable enough to name those because we can't change what we won't name. And so Mm -hmm. if you have a person who's walking around who can't or won't say, I'm feeling vulnerable or I'm feeling inadequate in this area, um, then we can't do anything with it. We can't speak truth to it. We can't change what we don't name. Yeah. Hmm. That's really good. Lindley and I were having this conversation this morning. Um, there's certain forms of art that help me name my feelings. Mm. Like sometimes I don't know how I'm feeling until I like hear a song that says it or read a book. Okay. Which I think drives a lot of my reading passion is that when I'm reading a really well-written story, it helps me identify my own feelings. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's exactly how I feel. Um, and for me, it's almost like my personality, I need external stimuli to pull the feelings out of me. Yeah. And Lindley doesn't. Mm -hmm. I think you naturally can name your feelings. And and over the last few years where we've had issues in our communication, I think that's been a big breakdown where you're very vocal and very honest and you feel like I'm withdrawing, but I sometimes just don't know what I'm feeling. Right. Uh, So I'm saying that because I bet there's a lot of pastors out there that feel the same way who who just aren't as gifted at naming their feelings to their wife as their wife is to them. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, again, that would be a cultural factor where women have had more opportunity to put language to their emotions in a, in a safe place um, and have had safe spaces, more safe spaces to process how they're feeling. We also tend to talk that way in our conversation. And so that's given us more opportunity and more vocabulary and language for what it feels like um, specifically when we're going through different things. Uh, You talked about your pain cycle. Mm -hmm. How does someone identify their pain cycle? I mean, how would that even, like, I don't even know what your term meant when you were talking about pain cycle, but how do you know if you're in that? 
So often we know we're in one with the reactivity because it's, if you picture an iceberg, it's the behavior we see above the waterline. So when you see blame, shame, control, escape Mm -hmm. showing up in your life or in your relationships, then you are in pain because the weed doesn't grow without roots and there is a root there. So often, especially at first, when you're learning to see this in your life, a good question is, I see this behavior. How am I feeling about myself or how am I feeling in the context of this relationship or circumstance? And that can be a good backwards way of identifying some of those feelings. If you're not in a specific situation where you're seeing that behavior and you're just curious and you're listening to this and wondering, what is my pain cycle? I think looking at your story in the home that you grew up in is a good place to start and saying, how did I know I was loved growing up? Or when I think about some of the painful stories in my childhood, how what messages did I receive about who I am? Or what messages did I receive about whether or not I was safe? And what did I do to survive those feelings? Did I go hide in my room and shut down? Did I fight back? Did I run out of the house? <laughs> and it doesn't have to be a dramatic, painful, you know, often when I have these conversations, people say, but I grew up in a great home and it doesn't need to be a a horrible story. We all have pain cycles. We all have messages that we've carried forward about who we are and whether or not we're secure and things we've learned to do to protect ourselves from that. And, And it doesn't necessarily have to be a dramatic story that shaped that. Is there a way to help, I mean, for listeners who, I mean, so many of our listeners have kids, to help kids identify a pain cycle? No, I think it's a great question because to Ben's point earlier when he said, I don't really have a lot of emotional language. Like often I have to read books or or hear a song to help me say, yes, that's how I'm feeling. And so our kids' pain cycles are evolving and it, it will probably take many years for them to really identify, yes, that's how I'm feeling. But I think anytime we can help a child give give them some language for how they're feeling. So if they're ranting about their hurt feelings from school, just be able to say, almost use some conjecture and say, it sounds like you're really feeling helpless in, in that situation. Or it sounds like maybe you felt like you couldn't get it right, no matter what you tried, you just couldn't get it right. And helping them sort of put some language to it is a great start. Um, and and I think when we're, that's a huge gift we can give our kids that a lot of us didn't have growing up. When we see our spouse going into kind of this pain cycle, this typical reactionary posture that they go to, um, it's typically never helpful when I tell Ben, oh, here you go. <laughs> like, you're going to go ahead and start blaming me next, right? You know, so what is the best response for this spouse? when they see a pattern from the other one? Yes, that's a great question and often not a very popular answer, but it it is true, is when we notice our spouse or someone we're close to going into their pain, if you find yourself wanting to correct or fix or name it, that is an indicator that your pain has gotten hit. And Mm. so now the tennis ball is on your side of the court and you walk through naming your feeling, (laughs) naming what you're tempted to do. We, we can only the, the best chance we have of helping the person that we're talking to, that we're close with, whether it's our spouse or somebody else, the best chance we have of being helpful to them and their pain is to regulate our own and take responsibility for what's on our side of the line. It Mm. does not guarantee that it's going to change anything of what's happening on the other side of the line, but that is our best shot because it's very hard for somebody to stay in their pain when I'm in my peace and connected. Mm. Um, And we can't control the other person. And so when we find ourselves wanting to do that or fix that or keep them from going further into their pain, we just need to stop and and do our own emotional regulation. Can I tell you a story about this? Sure. We were just telling some friends the other night. So a couple of weeks ago, one one Friday night, all of our kids are, of course, 
busy with friends. It's yes. like 4.30 p.m. And Ben said to me, I'm, I'm just bored. Mm-hmm. And it hit something so deeply in me. And I don't even know what. But I mean, I just was like, I started... I do know what I I didn't want to tell him what it really made me feel like. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, well, let me tell you, if you're bored, it's December. I have a list a mile long of ways you can help me. And I I wasn't trying to be sarcastic about it, but I was like, why don't we start with cleaning the bathrooms? Why don't we do like all these things? But when I went later and talked about the situation to my counselor, Mm -hmm. there's a fear in me that Ben will be bored with me. Mm -hmm. So when he says I'm bored, because Ben likes new things. He likes to start new things. And you would agree with that. You would say that. So when I hear him say, I'm bored, I'm like, oh, my gosh, what, you know, I got to do something new and exciting mm-hmm. to make him love me so that he wouldn't, you know, be bored of me. Mm-hmm. But really, it's a perfect example of like he yeah. he was literally just bored in the moment for right. like 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. And I should have just said, well, why don't you read? <laughs> like, <laughs> that would have been like the end of it. But it pinged my pain. Mm-hmm. So I did exactly what you said in that, like it pinged some pain in me that I then reacted on him in my story. Yes, that's a perfect example of what we're talking about. And an example of that it doesn't necessarily need to be an intended mean thing um, Mm -hmm. that, that trips us in our pain. There's a whole host of things. Often, if I'm in this space of feeling inadequate and my husband Jimmy says something pretty neutral, like what's for dinner and I don't have a dinner plan. Yes. You know, there's nothing wrong with him asking what's for dinner. And he is certainly not expecting me to have, you know, a a three course meal every night for dinner. That is so far from from his expectations or how we've interacted in our relationship. But if I'm already swimming in those painful waters, that's how I'm going to filter that neutral question. Yeah. Oh, I totally relate to that. Lindley asked me all the time, what are you doing tomorrow? Yeah. Well, Lindley is like that person that has like an hour by hour structure of what she's <laughs> going to get done tomorrow. She has a list prioritized. Yeah. And I just operate very differently. Sure. I, I'm very instinctive. I, I get a lot done, but I don't often plan to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it makes me feel super inadequate because mm-hmm. I'm like, you know what? I don't have my act together like you do. Mm-hmm. Can you just lay off? Mm-hmm. I'm like, I, I was actually just asking what time you're going into the office. Like, just curious. Yep. Yeah. Like, I just wanted to know if who needed to pick up a son or whatever. Right. Like, there's nothing right. behind the question. Right. It's, it's hard in when personalities are so different in terms of preparation. So for this podcast, you were extremely prepared for this podcast. You had this outline knowing now about your tendency to be perfectionistic. I can see that in the way you prepare. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Um, whereas I really love improv. Yeah. So for me, the best podcasts are when we show up and be like, hey, what are we talking about? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. But that is the opposite of how Lindley operates. Like on the way here, she was like, we need to talk through what we're going to do. Well, he won't talk about it. He's like, it won't be as good if we we talk about it ahead of time. (laughs) I'm like, but that's not how I work. I don't I don't remember things like he remembers things. I mean, he remembers lines of books. I just paragraphs of books. (laughs) Well, and and the other night you saw one of your leaders improvisationally responding to questions and it made you feel inadequate because like me, he's really good on his feet. Yes. I was at a work meeting and mm. he was answering all these questions and then he deflected one to me because it was in my area sure. and I totally didn't answer it right. And I mean, immediately afterwards, yeah. I texted him. I was like, oh, gosh, I'm so sorry. I was a failure in this question mm. because you're such a good responder. Like, you know, some people mm. just have that gift. Yeah. Um, And he he didn't even respond to that because he knew it was just like, I probably did fine. I just was beating myself up over yes. it. Yes. And you know how you would have answered it if you felt prepared. And, and Right. And I, I mean, I, I had a 30 minute drive from a different to a different office afterwards. And the whole 30 minutes, I was yeah. like, gosh, why didn't I say this? Why yeah. didn't I say that? That's very so, familiar to me, too. I get that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, anybody that's a public speaker like you are, or if you're a preacher, after you do anything speaking wise, the next couple yeah. hours are a lot of suffering. It's of, brutal. Oh, why did I not say that? Or why did I say that? Or Mm -hmm. why was my energy so low in that service or whatever? And Mm -hmm. you just spend a lot of time talking to yourself about your faults. Yeah. So that would be a shaming uh, reactivity (laughs) from the vulnerability of having shared. Um, I wanted to, to just mention something on the regulation piece, because we're talking about how often we can get triggered from a neutral question or statement that the other person didn't intend is hurtful. 
it's really important, even if they did intend it as hurtful, it's important to start the conversation with I am feeling. The temptation and even the advice we've often heard is when you did that or when you said this, it made me feel this. Often that's just received as a nice way of blaming. Mm -hmm. And it's just helpful to say, I am feeling without giving a specific reason um, and, and putting content into how we're feeling, what we're tempted to do, the truth and what we want to do instead. That's good. Um, because keeping content out of it will help us emotionally regulate and get to the bottom of what we're actually talking about. Cause often it's not about what it's about. <laughs> it's not about the dinner or what you're doing tomorrow or our plans for Saturday. It's, it's mm -hmm. really about that emotional conversation. Nicole, you said a statement recently. It said a lot of what we like to call personality is actually reactivity. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Um, Obviously, we are created differently. We are created uniquely. We have different personalities. And I think a lot of the inventories out there that help us understand ourselves are really helpful and interesting. I think a misuse of them and not what those inventories intended is that often we think our reactivity, the blame, shame, control, escape patterns when we're in pain are just a part of our personality when really they're behaviors that we have learned to rely upon to protect ourselves from that pain. Ways that we've learned to survive certain dynamics growing up or to manage the vulnerability when it wasn't safe and we didn't have a choice to do something different when we had less control as a child. And these are patterns that we then bring into our adulthood and our adult relationships. They are not the way we are created. They are things we have learned to rely upon that are totally understandable, but not very helpful. And I think the danger in calling them personality traits is that we almost bypass or, or relinquish the responsibility to grow in those areas. Uh, for instance, you know, kind of a, a posture of that's just the way I am, <laughs> or mm -hmm. that's just my personality. Um, the Enneagram is a popular uh, inventory that uh, comes up in conversation a lot. One example, you know, I'm, I'm an eight or I'm a two or I'm a four, you know, it, as a way of not looking at that behavior and say, no, I do need to grow in that area. And there's very good reasons that that behavior is there and that I've learned to rely upon it because I had to earlier in my story. But now as adults, we have more choice as to how we're going to steward that pain. And we are going to encounter pain. None of us are immune to emotion. But as adults, we do have a choice in what we do with it hmm. and continuing to rely on those understandable but destructive behaviors is not a personality trait, but something that we actually are empowered to work on. Are you saying that sometimes we just say, well, this is who we are instead of saying, well, actually, we're just we're escaping? Yeah. So one example would be I somebody who says I'm introverted um, and, and that is a personality trait. Some of us are more energized by being around other people and some of us need to be by ourselves to recharge so that we can connect in relationships withdrawing <laughs> when we're in pain is not being introverted. That's mm -hmm. cutting off or shutting down and disconnecting when we feel mm -hmm. emotional pain. And it might be that both are true about a person, that when they feel pain, they tend to cut off and they tend to be more introverted. But those are two separate things. And to say that I'm shutting down uh, because I'm introverted would not be an accurate statement that that's how you tend to cope with pain and that your growth edge is actually to stay connected when the conversation gets hard and painful. So uh, your experience as a therapist, do you see that some of us do, do you see people that take pride that we cope better than others? Can you Absolutely. talk about that a little bit? And I was one of them for a long time. <laughs> okay. Well, tell us about that. Yeah. So um, my pain that I tend to carry around and, and have to be extra careful with is when I feel pain, I tend to feel inadequate or not good enough. And I'm scared that I'm going to be rejected if I don't have a perfect performance. 
And so the way that I learned to cope with that is to be as perfect as possible and to prove myself to other people and perform to win people over so that I can feel good enough about myself and safe in the relationship. And I used to be really proud of this, that who am I really hurting by performing and um, being perfectionistic? And isn't everyone grateful for my efforts and the fact that I work so hard? Until someone was brave enough to give me the feedback that when I am in this perfectionistic performance mode, they imagine that I have the same amount of grace for them that I have for myself, which is exactly zero. Hmm. And so I become very unsafe when I'm in this performance mode because people don't feel like they can make a mistake around me. People don't feel like Uh, I'm going to have any grace if they do make a mistake or that they have to be perfect for me to give them their, my approval. And so I become really hard to connect with and people are afraid and feel rejected when, when they're around me in this mode. And so my point in sharing that is that certainly with blame, shame, control, escape, there are different consequences for some of those behaviors. And we can all imagine, you know, that some of them might lead to somebody getting physically hurt is very different than somebody just going in their room and shutting down for several hours. However, they are all equally relationally destructive. Mm -hmm. And so shutting down, yes, maybe somebody isn't getting physically hurt, but that is equally relationally destructive to blaming somebody and getting really angry. And I think we tend to look at the more loud, obvious coping behaviors as more destructive. And that is absolutely not the case. So it's easy to name a behavior like for people listening. If maybe they have somebody in their life who's pointed something out to them, how do you begin to take baby steps to change that? Like, how did you personally Obviously, you had this aha moment of, yeah. man, I'm I'm making other people feel like I don't have any grace for them or anything like what you were talking about. Mm-hmm. How, how did you personally begin to think, how can I change this? Sure. So as a restoration therapist, I would call that my pain cycle. So feelings I tend to feel and the things I tend to do in my pain. Naming it is really helpful because 90% of the time you're feeling those same three or four feelings when you're in pain, no matter how different the situation is. And you're doing those same two to three things, no matter how different the situation is. And so I know pretty much 90% of the time when I'm in pain, I'm feeling one of those things and I'm tempted to do one of those things. So identifying it is really helpful because we have to know what we're taking off in, in order to do something different. However, A lot of people stay with insight in terms of understanding what they feel and and understanding what they do, and they stop there. We have to know what we're moving toward. And so recognizing it is the first step. Um, And I can't expect self-control to be enough to change the behavior. So I can't just be feeling inadequate, be feeling like I'm not good enough and can't measure up to expectations And I might get rejected and expect to do something different and self-control be enough to do that because my brain has a neural pathway, all of our brains do, that when those feelings get hit, there is a well-carved pathway to react by performing, perfecting, or whatever your coping looks like. And so we have to go back to the root and, and, speak tender truth to that feeling that those feelings are real, but they are not true about who I am. And a lot of us hesitate to do this because we're waiting for the person who gave us that wound in the first place to correct it. Uh, We want our spouse to be the one to correct that message. But the problem is truth coming in from the outside is meaningful, but it's not powerful enough to to heal that wound on the inside. So if our spouse gives us words of affirmation or words of truth, 
that's really meaningful. But if it doesn't match what we're telling ourselves, it's going to rebound like a boomerang. Mm. <laughs> it, it's not going to have any kind of staying power versus if we're willing to say, here's what's true about me and here's what I'm going to do based on that truth. Then affirmation coming in from the outside has a lot more stickiness. So there was a, a couple I was working with. The wife was a lot like me. She grew up in a high achieving home where expectations were really high. And her parents were great parents in a lot of ways, but they were they wanted to protect her in in not feeling rejected. Um, and they felt like the best way to do that was to help her be as perfect as possible. Hmm. And the unintended message she grew up with was, if I fail or if I make a mistake, I am a disappointment. And in other words, if I feel disappointed, I am a disappointment. And so she came into marriage all excited because she thought the love from this awesome guy, and he is an awesome guy, is going to be enough to finally make me feel like I'm good enough and I'm wanted and um, that I don't have to keep performing for love. The problem is, and, and this won't be a surprise to the two of you, Love from someone else is not enough to heal the wounds that we come into marriage with. It is meaningful. It is helpful. But what this guy ended up feeling was, I'm just pouring affirmation into a black hole because she wasn't able, and, and our work together was helpful in this, hopefully, um, <laughs> but she wasn't able to give that until she was able to give herself that message and finally say, I did grow up feeling inadequate a lot, but what am I going to say about that? Instead of hoping that somebody is going to correct that message, what am I willing to say to that little girl part of me? Um, and how am I going to take an empowered stance toward myself and speak truth to her so that when my husband affirms who I am, that it actually is meaningful to me? instead of feeling good for a few seconds and fading into the background of feeling inadequate. Hmm. Um, and it was really meaningful for her husband too, when she was able to do that. Cause all of a sudden she's not coming to him in the, with this needy posture where it doesn't matter what he says or what he does. It's never enough. Um, but that he actually can love her in a way that sticks and, and makes a difference for her. That's really good. Yeah. So did you teach her how to say, I received that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, essentially. Uh, I, I have noticed I, I was with a group of colleagues and we had a we had a, a therapist guy join us and he was leading us through an exercise. And one of the exercises was go around and, and give each person some compliments. Mm. And when it came to me, I didn't even know what I was doing, know I was doing it. But every time they would give me a compliment, I would explain, well, that was a group effort. Yeah. You know, it takes a you team. You deflect. Yeah. And I remember him saying, wow, you were really awful at receiving compliments. Mm -hmm. Do you know that about yourself? Mm -hmm. um, I, know, I know that about you. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't, I actually, until that moment, hadn't really processed that, that yeah. uh, there is a place for allowing someone to affirm you and mm -hmm. it, that's all that needs to happen. Yeah. Um, so I, I think we're both bad at that, actually. I agree. Yeah. I agree. A lot of people are. It's very difficult to receive affirmation. I think it's because um, uh, an inferiority in me feels like, well, if you only knew all the areas, I wasn't as good as you're saying. Mm -hmm. So I need to correct this narrative. Um, instead of just saying, oh, you know, in that area, I was pretty dang good. <laughs> yeah. It's hard. Yeah. No, and that and would people be in ministry are that way. Yes. Yes. And, and that, I think there's a few reasons for that. A lot of us, our shamers, meaning when we're in pain or feeling vulnerable, even doesn't have to be that we're in a painful situation. We tend to speak unkind words to ourselves. So the affirmation coming in from the outside is uncomfortable because it doesn't match the message we're giving ourselves on the inside. I think we've also been taught, and I talk about this in my latest book, what if it's wonderful that celebrating the gifts that we have and the opportunities we've been given to use them is in conflict with our value of humility. Mm -hmm. When really 
if we recognize that God put these gifts in us and he's given us opportunities to use those gifts, we celebrate freely because to God be the glory, this is all credit to him. And so we can say, thank you so much, or I received that or some, some, um, statement that, that lets us absorb that affirmation, uh, because we're free to be humble and celebrate those gifts. Hmm. This is so hard even to listen to though, because I think having grown up, been in the Christian church scene, you know, it's always the one who is the least of these. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we talk about how, what a wretched sinner I am. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, the language in your head, you're almost taught this is that we're all really terrible people. We're broken sinners. And and those are true. Mm -hmm. So it's almost hard. Like, I don't really even know how many times I've heard a message of like, we are broken sinners and we, you know, should feel that way, but we're also good. Mm -hmm. We have good things too. Like that, that's just a message that I almost never hear. Yes, the, I don't think, and I love the church, and I think it it does um, mm. a beautiful job in this conversation sometimes. I think we're getting better at saying, yes, we are broken sinners, and we are deeply valuable. And until we understand the extent of our brokenness, it's hard to understand the extent of our value because of the lengths that Jesus came to save us in that place and, and how precious we were to him. And we we don't often start the conversation with the fact that first we were created unique and valuable and deeply loved um before sin entered the world you know we start the bible with all this language about and it was good um and i think that's an important place to start the conversation hmm. Hmm. so let's just say there's a pastor and wife out there listening and they're both in a season of reactivity mhm and they're having a hard time communicating because things keep exploding, but which which is increasing their sense of loneliness. Mm-hmm. How do you help a couple that are both in pain, both reactive, get back to that place of peace where they can communicate? I think, well, I know you can be in pain and at peace at the same time. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is we cannot eradicate pain from our lives And I know, especially in ministry, there's a lot of seasons that feel really painful and a lot of conversations and relationships and circumstances that can, that just feel like they hurt. We can't change, well, we can't eliminate that feeling from our lives, but we do have choices in terms of what we do with it. And so for the pastor who is feeling overwhelmed or inadequate or the spouse who is feeling helpless to help them in that place, um, those are just examples. We can feel a whole host of things. But as soon as that feeling gets hit, it's really empowering when we can understand that we have a choice in terms of what we do with it. So we'll still be in pain, but we have a choice of whether or not we're going to connect with each other in that pain or whether we're going to let it divide us. And the, the structure, we call it the four steps, um, the structure for regulating that pain so that you can connect uh, is naming what you feel, naming what you might be tempted to do in reaction to that feeling. So that would be the blame, shame, control, escape. Naming the truth about that feeling, because there is a difference between feelings being real and feelings being true, and naming what you want to do instead of what you might be tempted to do. So mm-hmm. what what is different or opposite to that blame, shame, control, escape? So if I have a tendency to withdraw and go into my room for hours and not talk to anybody, I'm going to stay connected and work it through. Um Now, that doesn't solve any problems. There's no content in naming the feeling, naming my reaction, naming the truth, and naming what I want to do instead. It's just a structure for getting us emotionally regulated so that we can have a connecting conversation with our spouse. And again, the circumstance might remain painful, but we're together in it. 
and the pain is not between me and my spouse, it's around us. And that is a huge difference between being in conflict and pain and being connected in pain. I want to speak to this just for a second. Recently, I was sharing with a group of leaders the results of Patrick Lencioni wrote a book called The Five Temptations of a CEO, which could have been called The Five Temptations of a Leader because they're all the same. But one of them is to value or prioritize invulnerability over trust. Hmm. And he says that a lot of leaders feel like it's too risky to share open feelings about their circumstances. So they just keep this facade that they've got it all together and people Mm -hmm. can see right through that. They don't trust that. Mm -hmm. So they distance themselves from leaders who are incapable of expressing. I feel very fearful right Mm -hmm. now Mm -hmm. about a situation we're facing. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's weird in life in that the thing that we don't want to do is the thing that we most need, which is we don't want to express our neediness or our inadequacy. But when we do in a safe environment, it's actually the thing that creates connection and growth. Mm -hmm. And so I I was even thinking about that in terms of preachers. There's a lot of preachers I know that are great communicators, but they they never tell a personal story of failure. Yeah. Or they're the hero. Or they've never (laughs) been the loser of the story. Yeah. And and over time, the congregation just begins to question the validity of the preaching. Mm -hmm. Can it really be this perfect? Mm Mm-hmm. So I think there are a lot of applications of what you're saying in terms of pastors being emotionally health, healthy. I think it affects not just their staff relationships, but their preaching, their teaching, the way they, they interact with people. It all comes down to that willingness to be real about what you're feeling. Yeah, because we all have a version of this. Yes, it looks different because we've all lived different stories and we carry around different wounds, but there's not one of us that doesn't isn't carrying around sensitive places where they feel inadequate or, or pain around their identity or pain around their sense of security and being willing to name that and make choices around it is hugely helpful for the people around us. It's a gift to other Mm. people who get to hear you share that part of your story. Hmm. Well, Hey, before we end, give us a quick preview of the Bible study you're doing with Lifeway. Yes. So this will be related to my latest book, What If It's Wonderful? We are talking about the vulnerability of joy and how we how joy requires more courage than we often think mm-hmm. and talking about the different facets of the depths of joy that, um, that we've experienced in our life and in our relationships. And we're going to be exploring that through the stories of six women in the Bible who also uh, – struggled to find the courage to experience joy. Can't wait for That's that to come good. out. Yeah. Thanks for yeah. partnering with us. We're excited to have oh you on our gosh. team. Oh my gosh. Are you kidding? I am so excited. <laughs> well, Nicole Zazowski, everybody, thanks for listening to the show. We hope yep. this uh, reaches your ears in a week when you're very reactive. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs>